So good morning, DEF CON. Good to see everyone made it through the festivities last night. All right, so uh, if you're here to learn how to break some wind, you're in the right spot this morning, so welcome. Um, so my name is Jason Staggs. I am a security researcher from the University of Tulsa in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And this morning, I'm gonna be sharing some of the findings of a research study that we've been conducting over the past couple of years uh, into an investigation to see just how resilient wind farm control networks are uh, to attack. All right, so a little bit about me again. I'm a security researcher. I love my job and I'm interested in all things security. Um, gave a talk at DEF CON here a couple of years ago called How to Hack Your Mini Cooper. Uh, so I really enjoy trying to break things. In fact, most of the time, I try to provide people with solutions or ideas on how to fix the things that I broke. Um, sometimes people are willing to listen to these ideas with, with open arms. Um, but in other cases, sometimes people just don't want to listen. And when people just don't want to listen, guess what? Bad things tend to happen. All right, so out of all the uh, awesome things on this planet we could possibly hack, why in the world would anybody want to hack a wind farm? Great question, let me explain. So whether we realize this or not, as a, as a country, as a world, as a society, as a whole, we are becoming more and more dependent upon renewable energy sources. In fact, one of the more predominant forms of renewable energy right now is wind-based energy. This is true for North America, Asia, and in parts of Europe, all right? Um, and in the United States alone in 2015, nearly 5% of all the electricity produced in this country came from wind-based power sources. Now, that may not sound like a whole lot, but according to the Department of Energy, they expect that number to climb just north of 20% uh, by 2030. So this increased reliance on wind energy will draw the increased attention by attackers of all shapes and sizes for a number of reasons, okay? And so naturally this, this raises the question, just how resilient are these control systems to attack? And I think it's very interesting that neither the hacker or academic community is really, really considering this just yet. Now, I know what you're probably thinking. You're probably thinking, well, Jason, isn't this just yet another insecure, vulnerable uh, ICS system that is, that's easy to attack? And while the answer to that question is most definitely yes, the bigger questions as to what are some of the more, uh, what are some of the bigger implications and some of the more sinister things that an attacker can now do with this level of access, those types of questions have not been uh, properly answered or even thoroughly considered yet, in my opinion. And so we'll talk about that in this presentation. Uh, so modern day wind farms are operated by a series of interconnected SCADA systems. So we have computers and networks in play of various sorts, okay? What's the worst that could happen? Well, in a lot of ways, a wind turbine is similar to a car. So just like a car, a wind turbine has to have its oil change and, and braking system and gears and rotors uh, um, serviced uh, periodically because there is a failure rate associated with those systems and they have to be serviced. Um, because if they, aren't, if they aren't serviced properly, guess what? Bad things will happen. In fact, don't take my word for it. Uh, check out this awesome 10 minute YouTube video whenever you guys get a chance. It basically shows what I'm calling a wind farm engineer's worst nightmare. So in the video, it shows wind turbines failing due to a series of mechanical failures because they weren't properly serviced and maintained, okay? Um, so in the video, it literally shows wind turbines catching on fire or disintegrating into a billion pieces. It's actually quite entertaining to watch. I recommend watching it. So I argue that some of these same types of mechanical failures could also be caused, um, or at least triggered or influenced by targeting insecure control systems. We'll talk about that. But most importantly, why hack a wind farm? Well, at the end of the day, we want to be able to prevent attackers from turning these peaceful systems into either targets of ransomware or worse, into massive burning wastelands. So what exactly is a wind farm? Well, fundamentally speaking, all a wind farm is is a power plant that converts wind-based energy into electricity. All right. Now remember, wind is a variable power source. It's not always guaranteed to be there. Um, so we have the wind turbines that are used to harvest this energy that gets converted into electricity, fed into substations, and then the voltage is stepped up and fed into the power grid. Okay, that's a 10,000 foot view of how the, the process works. Um, IEC 61400, this is a set of international specifications that define how wind farms are to be designed, operated, maintained, and sort of the, the abstract communications requirements between wind farm operators and turbines in the field. And so like I said, over the past couple of years, me and my research team back home in Tulsa, uh, we've been going all across America doing holistic security assessments on a variety of wind farms from uh, different vendors, different manufacturers, different makes and models. 
Um, and we've looked at everything from the physical security mechanisms of wind turbines to the actual hardware, software, and firmware that runs on the automation control systems. And yes, at times we did have to uh, climb to the very top of these turbines to gain a better understanding of how the controllers and field bus protocols worked. And then also to get a better understanding of how the different mechanical systems and processes in play uh, worked in the turbine as well. So if you were a security researcher or a pen tester with any fear of heights, this may not have been the pen test for you to be on. All right, so uh, real quick, just wanna talk about the anatomy of a wind turbine. So at the very top of the tower there, that housing is called a nacelle. Inside that nacelle is all of our interesting uh, mechanical components that makes a wind turbine a wind turbine. Okay, so things like your rotor system, pitch and yaw motors, braking system, low and high speed shafts, gearbox generators, all that fun stuff. These are the systems that service technicians will service and, and maintain um, on a periodic basis. So sometimes these things will fail and they have to be replaced. All right, there's a failure rate associated with them. If you are an attacker whose goal is to damage a wind turbine, these are the types of systems that you're going to be interested in targeting. All right, this is sort of a 10,000 foot view of the topology of a, of a wind farm, generically speaking. Okay, so we have a command and control center that's used to manage multiple wind farms. Then we have substations at the different field sites. Um, substations split into two different systems. We have the transmission control system that's used to harvest the electricity produced by the turbines and they feed that into the uh, power grid. On the opposite side is the operations control network. This is what the operators use to, um, to monitor and control turbines um, in the field. Once we get to the turbines in the field, all these turbines are sort of interconnected via fiber optic links in most cases. Um, everything's IP addressable and everything's on one big flat network. So there's real no notion of network segmentation between turbines or at least the automation control systems in a turbine. Um, so being able to talk from one automation controller to the other, other automation controller in different turbines um, is a thing that can happen, although there's not any operational requirement for this specifically. All right, here's a great perspective of the different network protocols in play between the operator and the automation control systems inside of a turbine in the field. So the operator can use any number of command and control protocols to pull or, uh, or send commands to a turbine to get it to do different things. Um, usually this is a flavor of OPC or some IEC based protocol. Uh, sometimes it's proprietary to the vendor. And then uh, uh, these, op these operators will talk to the uh, automation controllers. These programmable automation controllers are set in the base of the tower usually. And you can think of these as being a blend between a traditional PC and a PLC, all right? So operating systems wise, this, these guys can run anything from uh, Windows embedded, Windows CE. We've seen these guys run Windows 95 in some cases, uh, various flavors of Linux, um, and like uh, real-time operating systems like VxWorks, okay? Um, hardware wise, these boards can be custom designed by the manufacturers of the wind turbine. Um, other times they'll use off the shelf automation control systems and then the vendor will just roll their own software onto them. Um, they also have a field bus peripheral on them that's used to talk via CAN bus or mod bus or some, some kind of field bus protocol to other controllers on the top of the turbine that's used to interface with motors, actuators, sensors, and all that fun stuff. All right, IEC 61400-25, this is the part of the specification that defines how operators are to interface with uh, turbines in the field. So it defines what types of information the operator should be able to pull uh, from a turbine control system, and then what types of commands um, the operator should be able to send to a turbine in the field to get, to, to get it to put the turbine into different contexts or states. And then what the spec does is it actually maps this functionality back to a handful of protocols listed here, all right? Um, it's important to note that most of these protocols by themselves are inherently insecure. All right, so one of the more prevalent protocols that we saw during our research and assessments was a protocol called OPC XMLDA, stands for data access. And so the uh, HMI software that's used by the operator will use this protocol to uh, probe the automation control system, um, uh, the OPC server running on the automation control system to check on the current status of the, the turbine and send commands. And so uh, this protocol is nothing more than a SOAP-based messaging protocol. So we have XML objects going over HTTP. Um, and then if you look at the spec, the spec defines different types of messaging services. So in the event that the HMI software wishes to pull a turbine, it will send stuff like read message requests. And then in the event that the, uh, the, software, the HMI software wants to send like a, a command to write to a control variable in the OPC server, it will send a write, uh, write message request. 
All right, so here is the general rundown of the vulnerabilities that we were seeing across the board. Now, this wasn't true for every turbine, every wind farm that we looked at, but these were sort of the common themes of the day, if you will. Um, so automation controller wise, you know, these guys are running legacy operating systems. We've seen in most cases, everything's running as roots. Um, we got remote network management services, so like Telnet, FTP, SNMP, all that fun stuff. Um, trying to get access to these guys is fairly trivial in most cases. We've seen, you know, these guys are just running vendor. Um, they're just using vendor provided default creds or easy to guess creds. And oh, by the way, if you know the creds to one of these automation controllers, they're the same across all the automation controllers and the rest of the wind farm. So being able to pivot from one automation control system and move laterally is relatively trivial uh, if you know what those are. Um, like I said before, uh, network segmentation between wind turbines is not really a thing that's happening. All this stuff right here is sort of what we would expect from an ICS system though. There's really no surprises here, right? But what are some of the interesting physical effects that can be achieved if we start to chain some of these vulnerabilities together? All right, so if you take a closer look at the OPC XML DA specification, it clearly recognizes the fact that it is an insecure protocol. It's not using encryption or anything like that. However, it assumes that the implementer is smart enough to tunnel uh, this protocol over, over SSL or TLS, okay? And it says if you don't, you know, um, bad things could potentially happen. And here exactly is the part of the spec where it calls us out. Additionally, the spec says that you probably want to um, have some form of authentication or um, being able to disallow people to just arbitrarily send write message requests to the OPC server to control control variables, all right? And apparently the people that have been implementing these particular command and control protocols in WinForms didn't read this portion of the specification either. So here is a rundown of some of the items that are pulled for by the operator and returned to the operator um, and displayed in their HMI screen. So things like current wind speed, power production, um, ambient temperatures, controller statuses, things like that. Here's where things get a little more interesting. So this, so the types of commands that an operator can send to turbines in the field, um, this will vary from vendor to vendor, but generally speaking, there are commands that they can issue to change the maximum power generation of a particular turbine or there are commands that they can send to put the turbine into a certain operating state or context. So being able to do things like turn the turbine off or turn it on or put it into an idle state. One of the more interesting states that a wind turbine can be in is something called emergency shutdown mode or state, okay? And what emergency shutdown is, is in the event that a um, automation control system or operator uh, detects that there are external factors or conditions that could be damaging to a wind turbine, such as high gusts of wind or maybe a tornado is imminent in the area. Um, it decides that it's more advantageous to the turbine to shut itself off as soon as possible rather than continue to operate due to the fact that it might be damaged. And so the act of invoking a emergency shutdown is what we call a hard stop. And so when a hard stop is initiated on a turbine, what happens is the, 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 um, the blades on the rotor will flare out and then the uh, mechanical brake of the turbine will actually lock up to bring the turbine to a halting stop as soon as possible. And this is not a graceful shutdown at all, believe me. So when this happens, we actually notice that this will put excessive wear and tear on critical me uh, mechanical components inside the nacelle. So things like the gears and the rotors and the braking system and all that, all right? Um, also, the uh, physical integrity of the structure, the tower, and the rotor system is also affected by this. And there's been plenty of research that's been done over the years that back up those claims. Um, one side note, if you're ever doing testing or an assessment on a wind farm, and um, you're working with a group of wind farm engineers, and you attempt to put a wind turbine into a, invoke a wind turbine a hard stop more than zero times, they tend to get very, very grumpy with you. All right, let's talk about some of the uh, network attack tools that we developed for this stuff. So Windshark is a um, uh, network-based attack tool designed to target um, automation controllers uh, on, the, on the wind farm network. So the way it works is Windshark is designed to hijack control of wind turbines or to damage them. And, and how it works is Windshark will actually go out and scan for the IP addresses of automation control systems running certain versions of OPC or control services that we care about then it will return a list of those IP addresses to the attacker. The attacker can then select which IPs that he wishes to spoof commands or send commands to to put the turbine um, into a funky state or, or do something with it. And so by doing this, we can actually hijack control of some turbines. Now, this isn't true for every turbine that's going to vary. This process will vary from vendor to vendor and make and model. Um, 
So when we do this, though, the operator can still pull those turbines and see that, hey, something funky is happening. Somebody's messing with our turbines. So we still have that problem to deal with. Another interesting mode that Windshark has is something what I'm calling the hard stop of death attack mode. And the way this works is the uh, Windshark tool will put the turbine, it will force the turbine to hard stop, and then it will wait, wait for the turbine to recover, and then force it to hard stop again. And then it will do this process over and over and over again until either the attacker is removed from the network or execution of our program is halted. Um, so when we're doing this, we are um, introducing wear and tear, premature wear and tear on critical uh, mechanical components, meaning we are damaging turbines. All right, the next step up from this is a tool that we wrote called Wind Poison. So Wind Poison is a man in the middle tool that runs on a Raspberry Pi. And basically all we do is we do the old ARP cache poisoning trick to uh, poison the ARP cache tables of the automation control systems in the turbine and the operator's workstation. And so when we do this, we can now be selective as to which commands the operator can send to the turbines, um, if any at all. So we can do things like dropping those requests. Um, and then we can do stuff like fabricating the, uh, the polling responses back to uh, the operator. Um, so we can do stuff like, you know, turning off all the turbines in the wind farm or invoking the hard stop of death attack against all the wind turbines in the wind farm and then lying about the current status of those turbines to the operator. So these particular tools were designed to, to target the IEC 61400-25 uh, based uh, uh, protocol stacks and network services. We had to do some light command and control protocol reverse engineering to figure out what the particular values were of, a, of, a, of the protocols to put a wind turbine in a certain context. Uh, we put everything on a Raspberry Pi, tied it all together with Python, used some bash scripts. We used um, the Scapey and NNAP Python libraries for packet fabrication and port scanning. And then we did some IP tables foo for uh, dropping and forwarding packets across interfaces as needed. Let's take this to a step, uh, a step further though. So Windworm is a proof of concept that we developed in the lab designed to go after automation controllers that are configured in an insecure fashion. So what we do is we leverage the fact that all these automation controllers use the same creds and that we know what those creds are. So like, like I said before, most of the time these are vendor provided creds or easy to guess creds. So we assume we know what those are. We also take advantage of the fact that these guys are running things like FTP and Telnet. And what we do is we will actually copy ourselves via FTP and then invoke execution via Telnet. And we repeat this process over and over again until we're actually executing on all the automation controllers in the wind farm. Once we have execution on the automation controllers, we will interface with the field bus peripheral on the automation control system to talk to other controllers in the wind turbine that are more interesting to us. So things like the power controller or the motor controller. All right? And what we can do then is we can inject our own field bus commands uh, to do interesting things. So one of, the more interesting pro one of the more common protocols that we saw during our assessments was a protocol called can open. And so the way can open works is every controller has something called an object dictionary, which is very similar to like registers and Modbus. So it contains like controller configuration or process uh, control information. And these controllers will use this interface to sort of uh, uh, exchange information with each other or update process control variables. And so the trick here is figuring out what the mapping of this can open object dictionary is for a particular controller. And so if you know what this is, you can actually um, um, you know, do things like overriding critical process control variables to do put the controller into an interesting state um, to affect the hardware that it controls. Um, and so, lucky for us, uh, the can open uh, specification defines something called electronic data sheets that define how these controllers are laid out and mapped out. So it defines like the literal variable name for an item in the object dictionary, what its index is, subindex, um, what type of uh, what data type it is, whether you can just read or write to it. Um, so that sort of thing. And uh, these are usually stored on the file systems of these programmable automation controllers in a clear text file. So we can just read these and know what those mappings are. And basically you just repeat this process over and over again until you do the, the bad things that you wanna do to the turbine. Let's take this to another level. So what if we wanted to ransomware a wind farm? How exactly would this work? So I'm not talking about encrypting anything here. I'm talking about being able to paralyze wind farm operations in such a way that the electric utility is no longer able to produce electricity, at least until a ransom is paid in something like maybe Bitcoin. But how exactly would this work? This is exactly how an attacker would go about ransomwareing a wind farm for Bitcoin. And so the idea here is the attacker would only need single uh, physical access to a single turbine in a wind farm, okay? At that point, the attacker would introduce his propagating malware, very similar to the windworm that we just described. 
that malware, once it was executing, it would place the turbine into a paralyzing state, meaning that it would just um, shut the turbine down. It would then disable all remote network management services. Okay, so goodbye telnet, goodbye FTP. Then it will um, uh, start up its own TCP network service that would just wait there for the ransomware key to be delivered to it. At this point, you, the attacker, have gained control over the wind farm. And what you would do is you would send a ransom note to the electric utility saying, hey, congratulations, I now have complete control over your wind turbine assets. If you'd like to have them back in a timely fashion, please send me $10,000 in Bitcoin uh, to this address. If the, uh, the company decides to play ball and says, okay, fine, whatever, we want our wind farm back, uh, that's fine. The attacker would then provide the key, and then they would use that key to unlock the, uh, the wind farm, and everybody's happy. However, in the event that the company decides not to pay the ransom, that malware could have some logic built into it in such a way that says, okay, if I have not received my ransom uh, key within uh, you know, an hour, I'm going to go ahead and invoke the hard stop of death attack against myself um, every hour until I've received this ransom key. So now we have the problem of not only is electric utility losing out on money because they're not able to produce um, electricity, but now we have this interesting paradigm where the attacker is able to introduce damage to the turbines with this ransomware. Very interesting. What would be the, uh, the financial uh, impact due to a wind farm downtime, though? So if we take, for instance, a 250 megawatt wind farm that's been affected with this ransomware, okay, and we assume that electricity is 12 cents per kilowatt hour on national average, and we assume, worst case, a capacity factor of 35%, and then a best case of 100% for the wind farm, the company is going to lose out on anywhere from ten dollars to $30,000 per hour of downtime. That's a lot of money, folks. So what would you even do about this? How would you even begin to recover from something like this? And I think there's different perspectives on this depending on who you are. But um, you know, what, one thing you could do is you could re-image the automation controller file system. So sometimes this resides on a, a multimedia card like a compact flash or SD card. You could just re-image that way. In other cases, it's not so trivial because that file system resides on a flash chip that is soldered onto the board physically. All right? So good luck trying to do that in a timely manner. Um, and in the meantime, while you're trying to, find, trying to figure out what to do, you, the operator, are losing out on your ability to uh, produce electricity, which means you're losing money. All right, so in conclusion, um, wind farm control networks are extremely susceptible to attack. Again, this is just the tip of the iceberg based on some of the research that we've done. Uh, my advice to anybody with wind farm assets is to be proactive. Don't wait on vendors to uh, provide security. Verify vendors' claims on security. So if they're promising you encrypted command and control between uh, operators and uh, and the turbines, verify those clams. And lastly, retrofit security is needed. One thing that people could do to prevent all the attacks I just described is to introduce some sort of network segmentation between turbines um, and the substations. So one thing you could do is like encrypt all your traffic between turbines and the substations. So in the event that one turbine was compromised, that one compromised automation control system wouldn't be able to take down the rest of the turbines in the wind farm. And with that, I'm out of time. So if you have any questions, comments, or crazy ideas, I'll be around. Come find me. If not, thank you all very much.